Well, this day is already rich with good things. America's great heroes, and I must say today that Charles Tremendous Jones is a layman that I've admired through the years. I can't even remember. I think I knew him when I was a little kid. Uh, but it's so nice to have... Now, Charlie... Thank you very much, John. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tremendous Rawling. Thank you, Tremendous John. Now, now, folks, you know why I do that. I've been learning over the years and especially Dr. Rawlings, the longer you allow him to spend introducing you, the deeper in trouble you get. You just got to cut him off quick before he does any more harm. Well, it's great to be, I almost feel like it's homecoming because every time I, when I'm on the road traveling from Sunday night or from Baltimore driving from an airport, I'll switch on the radio and there'll be Landmark. And I just say, thank you, Lord, for the people at Landmark. Thank you, Lord, for Dr. Rawlings, the blessing he is to me. And what a great time it is to have this be great American heroes because Dr. Rawlings is one of my heroes. And everything in my book, many of you may remember years ago when I first met Dr. Rawlings, he called me on the phone. He said, I read the book, Life is a Minute, send me a thousand, he gave them away. And then when I met him, I realized why you love him and why so many people throughout America love him. He is one of my heroes, and to me, I'm glad, though, that there are Dr. Rawlings everywhere. Now, not like him, thank the Lord, but there's some great ones everywhere. And in my own case, I'm glad that in my life, all my great heroes were pastors. We had a great pastor years ago named Tracy Miller. Tracy Miller, when I say his name, my, my heart's warm. Tracy C. Miller. And I remember when our fifth child was coming along, I said, we're going to name him Tracy C. Jones after this dear pastor, Tracy C. Miller. Well, wouldn't you know, she came out a girl. So we named her Tracy Colleen Jones. And this year, she graduates at the United States Air Force Academy at Colorado Springs. And I should say, though, she had great training before she went to the academy at Word of Life up there with Jack Wurtson. And so we named her Tracy G.C. Jones. Well, he retired, and another great pastor came, a great Irishman named James E. Davy. And oh, what a dear man of God. He became one of my heroes, James E. Davy. Well, here comes our sixth, sixth baby along with us. We're going to name him James E. Jones after our pastor, James E. Davy. Well, wouldn't you know, she came out a girl. So... We named her, her Jamie E. Jones, and she graduates next year down at Liberty University with Dr. Falwell. Well, then that pastor retired. Then here comes another pastor. So I tell these pastors, now look at here, fellas. If you want a baby named after you, you got to stay longer because I can't turn these out overnight. So, so now, John, I believe if we'd be at Landmark, I'd have some Johnnies and Johns. But anyway, now he rose. The reason I always rush to the podium is never to add a lack of courtesy. Some people say, well, that's rather courteous, discourteous to cut off the pastor. But, you know, here's why I do it. I like to have a point in everything I do. I've been learning over the years that it only takes me 15 seconds to tell my whole life story. Therefore, I see no reason why I should allow somebody longer to introduce me than it takes me to tell you my life story. So I'm not going to tell you my life story in 15 seconds, and then we'll talk about more important things. My life story is I'm not what I think I am, I'm not what I hoped I'd be, nor I'm not what I ought to be. But by the grace of God, I'm not what I was. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's my life story. And that's everybody's life story who knows the joy of trusting Jesus Christ is their only hope in their Lord and Savior. And the purpose of this Sunday of Great American Heroes and every day is that we might all have the same life story. My life's verse is found in 2 Corinthians 2.14 in Moffat's translation where Paul said, Wherever I go, thank God he causes my life to be one continuous pageant of triumph in Christ. Brother, that's dynamite. Now, thank you, Mr. Mayor for calling me reverend. That was mighty nice. I appreciated that. But I'll never get to be a, a reverend or a pastor, so to speak. But people say, well, why are you up there in the pulpit if you're not a reverend? Well, but I am a full-time minister. Now, Dr. Rawlins, he, Dr. Rawlins, he is a full-time worker. And Harold, he's a full-time worker. The staff is full-time workers. This Christian school teacher here full-time workers. But every one of us who know the Lord Jesus, we are full-time ministers. Now, thank God that Dr. Rawlings, he is a full-time minister, too. 
But the real joy of a Christian is not our work. Now, I wish I could have been a pastor. I wish God would have called me to be a pastor. Well, all I do is sit in a study, study my Bible all week, and wait for people to come in and give me money. I wish, John, I wish, John, God would have called me to a deal like you got. But some of us got to work. <laughs> no, no, that's not, isn't that mean? That's not true. And anybody who works like a pastor, a preacher works. But I'm glad today that there was a time that I said, I saying, I wish I could be like that. But today I know the joy of the Christian is not our work. The joy of the Christian is not our ministry. The joy of the Christian is the ministry of God in Jesus Christ, that we are his workmanship. And we present our bodies a living sacrifice, and Christ lives in us, and he works through us to accomplish his purpose. So I am a full-time minister, and I was ordained in the 15th chapter of John. The Bible says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you might go and grow fruit. So this morning, I'm here with you as a full-time minister ordained by God just to be a worker with his ministry working through us and in us. But now heroes, that's my favorite word. Man, do I have heroes. I hope you have heroes. You know, if you go back in the time, you see why God gave us heroes. Jonathan Edwards, you all remember Jonathan Edwards the great preacher in early American history. And a lot of you remember, too, another name, David Brainerd. David Brainerd, another great hero of the faith. You know, it's interesting. You can almost tell a quality of Christian life if they have heroes. If you don't have any heroes, there's something wrong with your life. Because I don't care where you look, there's heroes, heroes, and heroes. Now, Jonathan Edwards, a great American preacher. Then along came a young man who died in his early life but made a great impact on America with American Indian, David Brainerd. What made David Brainerd so great? Listen to this. So completely did Jonathan Edwards' life dominate David Brainerd that it's necessary to know about Jonathan Edwards if you're going to know about David Brainerd. Spurgeon so admired the Puritan theology that his ultimate title seems to be best expressed in the shadow of the broad brim. But that influence came from a great company of men. It left Mr. Spurgeon free to develop a personality of his own. However, with David Brainerd, if ever a single man in due subordination to Christ was permitted to be another ideal, that was Jonathan Edwards became to David Brainerd. And then, how many ever heard of a great missionary speaker named Oswald Smith? Well, listen to what Oswald Smith said. The, great, the man who said, nobody ought to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ twice till everybody hears it once. And Oswald Smith, one of the great missionary preachers of the any age, listen to what he said about his hero. So greatly was I influenced by the life of David Brainerd in my early years of my ministry that I named my youngest son after him. When I was only 18 years of age, I found myself 3,000 miles from home, a missionary to the Indians. No wonder I loved Brainerd. Brainerd it was he who taught me to fast and pray. I learned the greater things that could be wrought by daily by contact with God more than praying than in preaching. Well, I just want to give you a little taste. Because see, America was founded by great preachers who had heroes. But I thought today, tonight, I'll be speaking to the General Patton's 10th Armored Division, the Tigers, the ones when the chips were down, when they called on that little group to say, can you get up there to Bastogne? Can you march a hundred miles in the snow and go in there fighting? General Patton says, we already planned it. We're already ready to go. And he says, we'll force those Germans down Montgomery's throat. We'll push them right back into them. Well, we didn't stop at that. I thought today we'd like to go back in history and share with you a some earlier heroes. Tell you, one wasn't an American, but he was an American hero, Columbus. Wonder how many people know today what made Columbus so the great man he was. Let me read to you what Columbus said and see if you can see a common thread in each of these heroes that we have in America. See if you can see the common thread that made them great. Listen to what Columbus wrote. Columbus wrote this. It was the Lord who put into my mind I could feel his hand upon me. The fact that it would be impossible, that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies. All who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There's no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. Christopher Columbus. You ever, did you ever hear that taught in schools? 
Well, not unless you had a Christian school, you wouldn't. Then there came a time in our life when they were when we had no constitution yet. They were meeting down in Virginia, and they were wrestling with what to do. And then a man named Patrick Henry got up, and thank God somebody made notes of the speech. But from his heart, he gave one of the greatest speeches that I hope ever and again you men will read it with your families, just like you would a devotional. And you all remember the last sentence in that great speech. Give me liberty or give me death. Well, all heroes would rather die for something than live for nothing. But people say, what would make a man say that? Well, let me quote from Patrick Henry's last will and testament what Patrick Henry said to his children. He said in his will, my most cherished possession, I wish I could leave you. My faith in Jesus Christ. For with him and nothing else, you can be happy. But without him and all else, you'll never be happy. Patrick Henry. Is it any wonder that Patrick Henry could speak from the heart words that men needed to hear? But look where he was coming from. Then there came another great hero, a hero named Daniel Webster. Let me quote something of Webster said. If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our prosperity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury our glory in profound obscurity. Daniel Webster was a man who would have been president of the United States. But he was different than most people who want some power. Daniel Webster knew that if he sought a compromise between the North and the South, it would cost him the presidency. And he did. But he staved off the Civil War for almost 10 years. They asked Daniel Webster, the great lawyer, what, Mr. Webster, is the most important thought that ever, ever entered your mind? And Webster replied, the most important thought that has ever entered my mind is my personal accountability to Almighty God. Now, how could Webster say that? I'll tell you how he said it. Webster knew that someday he'd stand before the judgment bar of eternity. He knew that God would either look in the books and judge him according to his works or look in the book of life and to judge him according to Jesus Christ and his blood. Webster knew that he had a lawyer named Jesus Christ. Webster knew he'd never stand before the judgment bar because his sins were forgiven. He was pardoned and he didn't know. He knew that the president of the United States was nothing that could add to what he already had. Well, I want to tell you, dear friend, thank God when you look at American history, I cannot believe what we have. And you know, when I talk about staving off the Civil War, I think we ought to take just a moment today and, and say a word why we lost the Civil War, why the South lost the Civil War. The South lost the Civil War because God wanted us to lose. God knew those great Southern gentlemen, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson. He knew those great Southern gentlemen had enough grace and wisdom to take defeat. Where them no good drunken liberal Yankees could have never stood defeat. And so God to save the Union had the South lose. That's right. I know they're not teaching that even in your school either, John, but it's true. Uh, people say, well, Charlie, you're always kidding. I'm kidding, but I'm serious, too. <laughs> well, that brings me, that brings me to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's motto hangs in my office. Abraham Lincoln says that I read it every day. I must confess that I'm driven to my knees every day by the overwhelming conviction I have nowhere else to go. My wisdom and that of all about me is insufficient to meet the demands of the day. Abraham Lincoln. Now, folks, today we live in a world where everybody's going crazy about all these wonderful things we need to improve ourselves. Well, now, I want to get something over here. Excuse me, just a minute. I brought along something, and this is down in your bookstores. I want all of you to get it. You know that one of my favorite quotes is this. You are the same today. You'll be five years from now except for two things. The people you meet in the books you read. The people you meet in the books you read. You hang around workers, you will be a better worker. You hang around soul winners, you will be a better soul winner. You hang around givers, you will be a better giver. You hang around a bunch of thumb-sucking, complaining, grabbing boneheads, and you will be a better thumb-sucking, complaining, grabbing bonehead. Now, 
Now, I love to hang around Abraham Lincoln. You say, well, he's been dead. I know, but I guarantee you there was not anybody living at the time Lincoln was living at New Lincoln that loves him more than I do. Why? Because I'll find a book like Lincoln, The Man in His Faith. Did you know that Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln had no self-esteem? Everybody tells me I need self-esteem. Everybody says, I need a good self-image. Lincoln had a poor self-image. Everybody says, you need, a good, you need a good education. Lincoln had two years of an education. People say, you need a good father image. Lincoln didn't even go to his own father's funeral. You say, you need a good home life. His mother died when he was nine. He lived in a one-room cabin the year after she was dead. Nine people in a one, eight people in a one-room cabin with no door or windows, crawl space. He said, well, you need to have good business associates. The first business venture he had went bankrupt. He spent years paying off the debts. You say, well, you, you, you need a good wife. He married his in-laws, never liked him. They thought he married down. She married down, not up. You say, well, he got elected, didn't he? Yes, he got elected. Did you know that when Lincoln was inaugurated the first time, they snuck him to Baltimore the night before because they were going to assassinate him the first time? Well, he got re-elected, didn't he? Yes, he got re-elected. Do you know how he got re-elected? Abraham Lincoln got a smaller percentage of the popular vote that was given even Walter Mondale. You say, well, the smallest ever given a president elected in our country. Our hero Lincoln. You say, well, how did he get elected? The miracle of the Electoral College made Lincoln. And then they shot him. Well, you know what I love about books? I'll tell you what I love about books. Lincoln had one thing going for him. He had a mother who loved God and loved the Word of God. Lincoln had four books. The Life of George Washington, who became his hero. Pilgrim's Progress, that taught him the beautiful allegories of the Christian life. Aesop's Fable, that taught him the humor and the storytelling. And the King James Version of the Bible. Lincoln read every book within 50 miles of where he lived. Lincoln didn't just read the books, he memorized them. Lincoln just didn't memorize the books, he realized them. He lived them. And Lincoln, who was born into the worst childhood a person could be born in, lived in the worst circumstances that a person could be live, lived in, who was elected in a political climate worse than any man could ever live in. And today, there's only one statue in Westminster Abbey in London, England, of an un-Britisher. Who is it? Abraham Lincoln. And how did it happen? The grace of God and a love for books. When I read this book, I called Tyndall House. I said, just like you call me, John. I said, send me, send me a hundred copies to give to my friends. He said, it's out of print. I said, send me a hundred copies. He said, it's out of print. I said, all right, reprint that book, and I guarantee every copy will be sold, or I'll buy every one. That Tyndale House has just reprinted thousands of these books, and you better buy one. Ah, uh, Lincoln. How about, how about Robert E. Lee? Can you talk about Abraham Lincoln without? Absolutely not. Because one of the great American heroes the world will ever know, if you read, is Robert E. Lee. You cannot read the life of Robert E. Lee without weeping. The man who could have been a millionaire, but chose to die in poverty when he took away his citizenship. They took away every nickel he had. They took away his fair home. And Robert E. Lee, when they offered him a fortune for his memoirs, he said, I cannot, I cannot make money on the blood of the men who died for the honor of the South. Robert E. Lee, who was born in the aristocracy of aristocracy, the only American family that had two members of the family sign a Declaration of Independence, the only family. And the Congress of the United States stripped him of his citizenship, and it wasn't until a few years ago they gave his citizenship back. But dear God, Robert E. Lee loved America. He didn't need politicians to give his citizenship back. Robert E. Lee was, knew he was the elect of God. He had a citizenship that even though he loved America, and he, was, he graduated, the only cadet ever graduated from West Point without one demerit, never been anybody like him since. The young man who was offered the commander-in-chief, the, the head of the entire Union forces, he said, I cannot fight against my beloved South. Robert Lee, who never owned a slave, laid down his sword and said, I'll never fight. He headed up the militia in Virginia to defend, not to fight the Union. Yet when you look at Robert E. Lee's life, when you read his letters, you'll find that it was, a, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Lord Jesus Christ in the life of Stonewall Jackson. You go right down through history. Every great man from Sam Houston, the first one who loved the Union that, uh, openly, the one who gave us the whole West. Well, it was the love of the Word of God, the knowledge of the Word of God, all these heroes. 
Then we skip up to World War I. Who was one of the heroes we all remember World War I? Sergeant Alvin York. The turkey shooter from Tennessee. He didn't want to go. He didn't want to kill anybody. The Bible he knew said, thou shalt not kill. And his major said, if you don't want to go, I'll see that you don't have to go. But Major Buxton said, I want you in a Bible study. So Albert and York and Major Buxton had a Bible study. He said, now you go home. You think about what the Word of God teaches. And Albert and York went back to the hills of Tennessee to rethink what this dear Major who loved God and loved the Word taught him. Didn't tell him what he ought to do. Showed him in the Word of God what he ought to do. And Sergeant York came back and said, all right, let's go. And you all know the rest of the story. And then came World War II. There were a lot of great heroes in World War II. Because we didn't have any Sam Donaldsons or Dan Rather then. We had, we had at least a moderate press. They could share both sides without feeling guilty. And we had a lot of heroes. But when they asked General von Rundstedt, ahead of the German army, who is the greatest American general? There was no question. Patton is the best. You know that General Patton did not learn to read until he was 10 years of age? You know that at age 16 years of age and 17 and 18, I have his diary right here. We don't have time to read it this morning. I'll be sharing it tonight. I have gone through the diary of George S. Patton, and I can show you page by page. Before General Patton went to Virginia VMI, before General Patton went to West Point, he had already become the German the, the general the Germans would fear. Because here it is. He had fought every battle. He lived it in the books. In the book of all the books. Do you know that General Patton never went to sleep without an open Bible next to his bed? You say, well, did he read it? Did he read it? Do you know that General Patton, when we were bogged down and the Germans were slaughtering Americans, he called in the chaplain. He said, listen, chaplain, I believe God's about time. God got on our side. You write us a prayer to help get God to get this weather clear. And the general says, listen, I can't, I can't pray that we have good weather to kill our enemies. And General Patton says, are you trying to teach me th theology or are you with us? So that patent went out, that, that chaplain went out, and he wrote a prayer. And this is what it said. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers to call upon thee, that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Amen. And you, did you know that General Patton is the only general we've ever had that had 450,000 prayers printed and sent out to every man in his army? Well, thank God for General Patton. I have a book with me today. I'm going to give it to Harold. Holy gave John one. You can't help but think of John Rawlings when you read about him. Listen to this. He's a young lieutenant talking about serving with Patton. I remember one conference when General Patton stopped the colonel in the middle of a sentence. The colonel stated, we're low on supplies and gasoline. There's plenty available, but Washington is not getting it to us fast enough. We're losing training time in the desert. We can slow our training and get even with Washington. If they cause delays, we'll show them how to really delay a program. We can get revenge by... And then General Patton cut the colonel off, saying, Colonel, revenge belongs to God. We don't try to get revenge against anybody to get our supplies. If we can't get supplies, we'll go with what we've got. If we go out for revenge, it could be we would never get our supplies. we destroy our best efforts if we work on revenge. Revenge belongs to God. I believe a lot of us ought to be learning that too. Listen to this. The clean feet principle of General Patton does not merit any great amount of attention unless you have sore feet. But I associate this principle with the washing of feet in the Bible. Although General Patton never mentioned this with his foot care briefing, he was always reading the Bible and advised it to do the same. Read some of the Bible every day. Study those chapters where it talks about the desert of North Africa. 
We're going to be fighting in Africa. You remember every mountain and water hole mentioned in the Bible. He could save your life. The Bible is accurate reporting. If the Bible says it's there, there's a source of water, the chances are great, it'll still be there. General Patton. Well, we got to get down to home now. Because you see, we've had great American heroes in the military. But we've had them, too, in the mission field. And by the way, they weren't all Americans. There was David Livingston. He's a hero. Why? Because Jesus Christ was his hero. Livingston never wanted to go to Africa. He wanted to go to China. When he got to Africa, his son died. He sent his family back. Years later, when he went back to bring his family back, as soon as he got to Africa, his wife died. Then one day, when Livingston could no longer preach, they carried him on a stretcher back into the darkest Africa. They found him one day on his knees. They thought he was asleep. And finally they went to him and he died on his knees praying. If you go to Westminster Abbey in London, you'll stand on the gravestone of David Livingston. But David Livingston isn't all there. You know why? Because before they shipped David Livingston's body back to Africa, the Africans cut his heart out. They said, we'll send you the body. You can have his body. But we're burying his heart because his heart belongs in Africa. That's a mark of a soldier of God. Heroes. Oh, I tell you, you wonder why I talk about reading? You wonder why I want you to read? If you don't read, where are you going to learn this? How are you going to know about our heritage? How are you going to know about our heroes? And if you don't have heroes, how are you going to be what you were meant to be? Watch my knee. Watch my knee. In the book, The One Minute Reader, there's a chapter in there, where, a page where Jerry Falwell talks about reading Watchman. He changed his life. You know how that Watchman, he got saved? A great, a hero of the faith, Hudson Taylor, was preaching in China. And Watchman, he had heard all the nonsense preached by all the religious people. Anywhere he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, Watchman, he gave his heart to Christ. And in a... Con- Oswald Chambers' uh, hero, Charles Spurgeon. How I love Spurgeon. I'll tell you another person loves Spurgeon. I get up with Dr. Rawlings preaching, he loves Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, I know God chose me before I was born because they never had any reason to choose me after I was born. (laughs) Amen? Good theology. And one night, Charles Spurgeon, the greatest of all the preachers of his age, one night, Oswald Chambers, this young artist who was going home from church, and his father was a Baptist pastor, going home, he said, Father, had Mr. Spurgeon given me an opportunity tonight, I'd have received Jesus Christ as my Savior. And Spur- uh, Oswald Chambers' father said, well, take care of his son. And on a street corner in London, England, that night, they bowed their heads. Oswald Chambers received Jesus Christ as a Savior. And Oswald Chambers died then at age 43 years of age in 1917. Get this. 29 of the greatest books today in Christendom were written by Oswald Chambers, who never wrote a book. His wife wrote all his books after he died. Well, dear friends, everything I've said with you today, I can quote you a line. I can quote you a sentence of Oswald Chambers that I've read, where my seat came up. And the United States chaplain, the United States Senate today, there's a chaplain named Richard Halverson, one of the greatest men of God you'll ever, ever hear. And you know who his hero is, one of them? Oswald Chambers, every day of his ministry since 1936, he's read a page. And in the one-minute reader, Dick Hoverson tells how that God gave him Oswald Chambers after he came to know Jesus Christ as a Savior. Well, my earliest here, Jim Rudisville, let me get to the word now. We could talk about Doss Troutman. When the Arizona went down at Pearl Harbor, find out about the navigators. Many, many young sailors went right to be with the Lord. Why? Because a young man named Doss Trotman taught two young sailors at San Diego some scripture verses, and they read, they led many young men to Christ who went to be with the glory rather than going down with the Arizona. A.W. Tozer, Watchman Nee, A.B. Simpson, heroes. But you know what? what's the common thread through all of their lives? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The greatest businessman in my whole life, Jim Rudisill, the president of the printing industry of America, at age 56 years of age, when he had just moved into a beautiful home, just built a great business. And then he came down with cancer. Six cancer operations, three heart attacks and a stroke. I go to see Jim, 56 years old, my hero, laying there. He said, Charlie, don't make me laugh today. It hurts too much. He said, now, when you come back to see me the next time, Charlie, you know, I won't be here. I'll be with the Lord. You'll see me in my casket. 
Billy Charlie Jones, and here's a young man, and brother, thank God that he gave me heroes that were real men, not just men, I mean real men. And here was my hero. Now he was no longer the president of the Chamber of Commerce, no longer the president of the industry of America, no longer riding high. Here he is, shrunk down, lost all his weight, almost a skeleton, laying there. And he says, now, let me give you a going away present. He said, go get your Bible. And here's what I read. Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I, which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Well, I have a lot of heroes, you can tell that. But my real hero is Jesus Christ. But the reason I mention these heroes, every one of the heroes I can see in history, it was God's word that made them men. And Jesus Christ is that living word. And in March of 1950, somebody gave me John 3.16. I didn't know much. I couldn't figure it out. He just had me read some verses. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In March of 1950, I bowed my head and I asked Christ to come into my heart. I prayed something like, Lord, I don't know how to believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I don't know how to have faith. And I didn't know how to have faith. And I didn't have any faith. But with all my heart, I knew the word of God was true. With all my heart, I knew somehow God was God. That Jesus Christ was a son. And I knew there was no way I would ever get to heaven under my own merit or my own works. And Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. And somehow with my heart, I asked God to help my unbelief and forgive me of my sins that come into my heart and made me a Christian. I was 37 years ago. There hadn't been one second of my life. I haven't been 37 years. I've never been powerful. I've never been good. I've never been righteous. I've never been faithful. He's my faithfulness. He's my righteousness. He's my goodness. He's my hope. He's my love. The joy of the Christian is our hero that not makes us these things for him. The joy of our hero, he is everything for us. If you want this to be a real Sunday of heroes, as we pray now, you do like I just say, God, I don't know how to believe, but I know one thing, I'm lost. I don't know where I came from. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know why I'm living. And God, I surrender. I surrender. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. You do that, and I guarantee you, God says, and the Word says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.